Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really honored to have you all here today. It's um, it's been a it's been a rough year in InfoSec this year. Um, we had the passing of InfoSec luminary Becky Bass, um, and then uh, according to Wired, Dennis Ritchie passed away again. And um, I don't know if you heard, but uh, worst of all, DefCon's been canceled this year. But uh, deserving of it or not, the uh, the most disastrous media coverage in InfoSec this year has revolved around the DNC hacks. And with that, I'd like to welcome you all to my new talk, Hacks, Lies, and Nation States. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mario Di Natale, and um, according to the FBI, I am the top cybersecurity and incident response expert in my state. However, as incredibly flattered by that endorsement as I am, it shouldn't impress you. And uh, during this talk, you'll learn why that is. You'll also learn why the FBI's report of the DNC hack was fatally flawed, how to identify and avoid some of the snake oil and scams that are prevalent in this industry. And when we are done, you'll have a real understanding of the government's true cybersecurity capabilities and what we as hackers can do to help. At a very young age, I got hooked on drugs, and this was my drug of choice. This is a visualization of two modems negotiating a connection. I've never been able to get enough of it, and it completely rules over my life. In early adolescence, I was obsessed with playing BBS games. Now, I'm really dating myself here, but um, for those of you that, that don't know what these are, BBSs were like little mini internets that we could dial into with our modems to chat and play games. And the problem was that most BBSs only let you play for a limited period of time, and then you got kicked off in order to let other people use that line to connect in. So um, that's when I had the idea to start playing games on, on multiple BBSs at the same time. So when I got kicked off one, I could I could just jump onto the next one and, and keep playing. And in my child's mind, the logical next step was to have my computer dial every phone number in the 203 area code looking for new BBSs. What I found instead was a connection to Bristol Myers Squibb. And uh, a few password guesses later, I discovered something far more thrilling than any game. I had discovered what I'd been put on this earth to do. It wasn't too much longer after that that I was finding ways to jump from an early service provider called Prodigy out to the Internet without paying for it, which was great because I, I loved the Internet, but I was, I was eight years old, so I definitely couldn't afford to pay for it. Uh, it was also around that time I became obsessed with these. Cray supercomputers. The problem was, for a kid that couldn't even afford to pay for Internet access, there was definitely no way I could afford to pay for a $5 million supercomputer. But I needed to play with one. The idea of it consumed me. Who would I even do with one of these? But I became obsessed with getting access to one to play with. And eventually I did. Uh, as it turns out, the only people that could afford these machines were exactly who you'd think. So... First, I worked my way around the NSA looking for theirs, but I couldn't find it. Um, at this point, I went after NASA, and uh, I had much better success in finding and gaining access to theirs. And uh, one day when I was trying to figure out how to get my password cracking programs to actually compile on NASA's Cray, my mom walked in on me and asked me to clean my room. Without even thinking, I just blurted back, Ma, I'm busy hacking NASA right now. Could you please shut the door? Uh, predictably, my mother freaked out on me. Uh, told me the FBI was going to come and arrest me, which was terrifying for a computer-addicted preteen because if I got arrested, I would definitely not be able to play on my computer. So I did what any reasonable kid would do. I stopped hacking? No. I ran a counterintelligence campaign on the FBI. Uh, first, I started searching through and reading their emails, but that was basically pointless because there was a high volume of it, and most of it was just, you know, awesome gossip and funny pictures. But uh, their field agents were using radios and cell phones. So first I tried listening to their radio transmissions with a scanner. However, that also didn't pan out, as they had uh, adopted encryption on their radios even back then. So logically, the next step was to hack my phone company, uh, obtain the billing records of all the numbers associated with their field office, and then reprogram Nokia 900 to monitor and record all those numbers. 
it actually became a common occurrence in my house for my, for my father to yell at me to stop spying on the FBI and finish my homework. But um, eventually my paranoia subsided when I realized the feds had no idea that I even existed. Not a clue. And that's when I became more brazen with that particular trick. This slide is actually of me at the DEF CON hacker convention uh, attempting to spy on the feds who we thought were spying on us. We actually never did catch them using their phones, but the reporters loved it. Uh, I was very fortunate at the time, though, that the convention's founder, Jeff Moss, better known by his handle, The Dark Tangent, interceded when he saw ABC trying to take pictures of me as a minor, and he only let them take a picture of my hands and equipment instead. But uh, after this photo was taken, I did up having to take a hiatus from hacking for a little while, but not for the reasons you're thinking. The feds never busted me, but my school did. You see, the, the reason I had so much time for cyber shenanigans was uh, because I could hack into guidance at my school to change my attendance records, my grades, and uh, I accomplished this with a little assistance from, uh, by a program called Loftcrack, put out by the hacker group Loft. And we'll address why they're so important in a minute. Uh, one day we had a teacher who had suspicions that two students had cheated on an exam and told us that if we didn't turn them in, that he would actually fail the whole class. Now, since this was a, a college preparatory school, they didn't ever actually fail anyone. What this threat meant was that we would all have to go to summer school and accept the grade that we got upon completion of summer school, which was a major problem for me, as I had big plans to go to hacker conventions that summer. And this teacher's plan would seriously impede those goals. In my mind, the solution was simple. Instead of just changing my grades, I would just change the entire class's grades from Fs to As. Boom, no summer school for anyone and I wouldn't stick out as the only one in the class with a passing grade. Unfortunately, I made the crucial mistake of telling my panicked classmates what I did. And they told people who told people, and then that happened. But I did fine. I didn't get expelled. They did ban me from touching any of the computers for the rest of my duration in high school, but after that I went on to continue honing my skills in college and later at several great tech companies where I used my talents to build secure systems for a multitude of great government agencies and private sector organizations. Fast forward to last year when I was the Chief Information Officer for the City of Hamden. The city got hit by these guys. Pretty bad. First they hit our police department, but I had built that system very robustly. We were able to recover from snapshots rather quickly. No real major damage done. We reported it to the FBI and their team seemed interested, but not all that interested. But the Tesla Crypt guys weren't too happy about not collecting that ransom. So they hit the town systems next, and I was still in the process of modernizing that infrastructure. So this time the damage was slightly more dramatic. And this time they were asking for a half million dollars worth of Bitcoins. We weren't going to pay it. As bad as it was, my team and I worked through the night to get our backups restored, everything else. We were back up and running. We lost about a day's work. Um, and that's when the Tesla Crypt guys got, got really upset about that. They started, they started pounding us with floods of emails containing their malware. The load was so high it overwhelmed their spam server. And once that was done, they started hitting us with distributed denial of service attacks. The situation was rapidly getting ugly, and our mayor asked me to reach out to the FBI again to see if there's anything that they could do for us. The feds informed me that it was unlikely that they could do anything as we hadn't paid the ransom. We weren't really interested in investigating anything without a monetary loss. I was assured they had an open investigation to the Tesla Crypt group. It was based out of their Las Vegas field office, and that dozens of agents have been working the case since last year. That didn't help Hamden's situation. The water was coming in faster than me and my understaff team could bail it out. The entire town's productivity was dropping, and my team and I were convinced we were all going to lose our jobs. We were rapidly approaching an event horizon. I have a very particular set of skills skills I've acquired over a very long career. It's a nightmare for people like this. With the city under attack, <clears throat> I took a sample of the malware from Hamden and I rushed it to my home lab. I isolated it, I disassembled it, and I found a critical flaw. A flaw that allowed me to seize control over their entire command and control server architecture. And I used that control to lock them out, shut down the attack, and trace their connections back to them. I gave them a taste of their own medicine